an original. From Story Studio Network. Uh, once around the park, James, and don't spare the horses. <laughs> Well, here we go. We've made the turn into June. And uh, the legislature at uh, Queens Park getting set to uh, recess for the summer. So, and we would typically take a break too when the legislature takes a break. It's Dave Trafford with Keith Leslie this morning here on the Ledger Ontario Politics Podcast for Story Studio Network. And Keith, this might just be one of the first summers that resembles a normal summer for this Ford government since they took office back in 2018. Because remember, that first summer was just fucking chaos. Ooh, yeah, that's, <laughs> it was a fire hose of chaos coming <laughs> right. in every direction. Uh, absolutely. Uh, and now, yeah, so uh, uh, one year after their re-election, uh, things seem to have settled down. In fact, the biggest speculation going on right now is whether there will be a cabinet right. shuffle. Uh, before, you know, the recess, they're going to have one more week of sitting and then they're recessing for the summer, which of course would give, if there were a cabinet shuffle, I have no idea if there will be or won't be, it would give the new ministers lots of time to get up to speed in their portfolios and all that sort of thing. Uh, I don't know the, 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 every time there's buzz about a cabinet shuffle, it seems to center around Caroline Mulroney and a not fantastic job she's been doing as transportation minister. Uh, but she was front and center yesterday, uh, Thursday with, uh, Premier Ford down in Kingsville announcing uh, the contract for the twinning of Highway 3 and a, a new uh, interchange for the 401 in Windsor and and all these other, lots of money for southwestern Ontario, big developments and promises there. Uh, so she was front and center there, key in that announcement, and, and uh, the Premier kept it. Well, I'll bring the Minister up to answer that one for you. So there didn't seem to be any, you know, uh, shade coming from the Premier's office towards the uh, Transportation Minister. So if there is a Cabinet shuffle coming, I... I, I I suppose it would be just because people think that they're due one, but I haven't heard anything firm to confirm that they're due. Well, and, and Sabrina and Angie reporting in the uh, Queen's Park Observer, pretty much what you uh, noted. But, um, you know, the, the, the remarkable thing in all of this, whether or not Mulrooney survives, if in fact there is a shuffle, is that um, the health minister is appears untouchable. I mean, I just don't, I don't get it. Uh, holy cow. Yeah, it's uh, it's incredible. Uh, apparently the NDP, uh, you know, uh, have been all over this minister trying to get her, uh, the Minden hospital is, is now the emergency room is now closed at the Minden hospital. Uh, and this was a Tory held writing. Lori Scott all of a sudden is talking about trying to come out and defend them. Where's the health? Where, where's Cindy yeah. Jones? Yeah. Where on earth is the minister of health and all this? Like so many other things on this health file, she's just missing in action and, 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 you know, not to be seen, not to be defending anything. So. There's a milk carton uh, I mean, campaign, knows. I would ask, I think. <laughs> <laughs> uh, she does show in question period, but, uh, you know, she just gives answers that uh, really are non-answers. And, and the opposition goes, says, well, you know, she's either misleading us or not answering mm-hmm. at all. Uh, so there's, there's so much going on within the health file. Uh, and yet, as you say, the, any talk of a cabinet shuffle seems to center around Caroline Mulrooney, as opposed to the health minister, uh, who you know, less, and, and deputy premier, mm-hmm. yeah, exactly. As well, uh, you know, she's she's got both these roles. Very low profile for such a high profile position or two positions. So, uh, make that of what you will. It's it's it, you know that's that's the politics of it all. The politics of it all, as far as healthcare is concerned, is for the Ford government. Is you know, do what we want you to do, say what we want you to say, and that's very much. Uh, we're on track. We're putting all the money elsewhere or, or into the health care, not elsewhere. Excuse me. We're putting all the money into health care. They had the FAO report this week that said, indeed, they are funding health care at the level and spending the money like they should be spending. Perhaps even uh, there was a suggestion too much has been set aside. But of course, that's set aside because they're going to have to make some payments to uh, nurses and others because of the, the 1% wage freeze. Uh, and they were warned mm-hmm. about that. Big money, big, you know, the healthcare workers being held at 1% after the pan, during and after the pandemic is going to come back and cost the government hundreds of millions of dollars. And so they budgeted for that. Uh, but again, just, you know, more on that health file. Why couldn't that have been handled before we get to this point uh, in the middle of the pandemic? Why couldn't we have addressed the nurses with, you know, something that made them clearly the nurses were not happy with what happened and how they were treated. Uh, and so this minister seems to have no one positive or no one saying anything positive about her except the premier who, of course, calls her a champion because, you know, she's out there defending all this privatization and various uh, aspects of the health. We bring in more private providers in the healthcare system, 
and you know, insisting that it's not taking uh, staff, nurses, doctors, uh, and others from the public system to staff these private clinics. Well, of course they are. Then they, they, they tout that now. Well, we're sharing. It's the same doctors. Mm -hmm. It's the same nurses. Well, then they're not working. You know, you're you're taking money and resources out of the public system to fund profits in these private clinics. There's no two ways about it. And again, at this transportation announcement Thursday down in Kingsville near Windsor, uh, the Windsor mayor was there, as was the chair of the uh, or the CEO of the Windsor Regional Hospital. And when Ford was asked a question, you know, come on up here and tell them about these private clinics. You've got the cataracts. So you know, this was a, a, an announcement about transportation. And he brought the, the uh, CEO of the Windsor Hospital to come up and said, well, yeah, we, we got our own doctors. They wanted to set up this private clinic for cataracts. And he went so far as to say, and the only difference is you don't have to pay for parking at the cataract clinic. <laughs> Woohoo! Woohoo! <laughs> no mention of any possible upsells. And again, you yep. know, certainly there was a lot of cataract surgeries performed at that private clinic. Was there upselling? Was there all these other concerns? We don't know. But we do know that each of those cataracts was funded by the public system cost a lot more to taxpayers than the cataract surgeries performed in the actual hospitals by those. Yeah, and that's what gets hospitals. lost in this discussion. I, I think if the delivery were, you know, apples to apples, that's fine. But it's not. Because what's going to happen at the end of the day is, to your point where we start dealing with capacity in the system, doctors, nurses, technicians, whatever, are going to be, it, it, we've only got a limited number of them. So... Doing more work just means we've got fewer people to do the more, more work. That's one thing. But if the you know procedure cost $500 in the public system and we go to that new clinic and it costs $800 and my OHIP card is just as good at either place, it just means that we've spent you know an extra $300 or whatever the difference is on that procedure. At the end of the year, that's a lot of freaking money. <laughs> Right? Holy, Holy crap. Holy cow, it's a lot of freaking money. It's a lot of money for going for profits instead of going into more surgery or surgeries or procedures. That's just no two ways around it. Uh, and again, we are. Th there's no two ways around the fact we are absolutely paying more to have every procedure that's going to be performed in a private clinic more than we are paying the public system to perform the same procedures. So when these private clinics, you know, wait outside to uh, recruit nurses after they come off a 12-hour shift, and say, hey, how'd you like to work, you know, Monday to Friday and an eight-hour shift? And, you know, maybe you have to work a couple of weekends or evenings, but we'll give you much more predictable hours. And better and, pay. And, oh, way better pay and benefits, yep. by the way. Uh, and far less stress, far fewer patients, no complicated patients at all. Uh, that's quite appealing to the staff. And you can't blame them for Not considering and, and taking this. This is, you know, the, and again, especially the way this government has treated them, uh, as government employees, so why wouldn't they consider if they can get offers elsewhere? Absolutely. But why do we need to have that profit-taking? Uh, study after study, Alberta, another study just came out of Alberta. Mm -hmm. It does not save money. These private Nor does it deal with the backlog. This. No, not in the long right. run. It absolutely doesn't. What would deal with the backlog and deal with the, uh, take the profit-takers out of this system is to expand the hospital operating hours. Most of them close at like 3.30 now. Expand them to eight o'clock in the evening. Expand them on we all that sort of stuff. Or e e <clears throat> there's so many options. We're not the healthcare experts, but we do know, or I feel strongly, that taking profit, you know, just carving this way out by paying more for each of these procedures that's going to be performed in the clinic. Okay, that'll help cut down the wait list, I guess. Eventually, hopefully, but wouldn't putting that same extra money into the private system before that many more surgeries in in a lo you know the, in the longer use of the operating rooms? get us the same goal, but get more to actually achieve more by getting more surgeries or procedures performed? It sure seems like it would. Why do we have to have profit takers come in? I know that's a, a big debate, but this is, we start out on the yep. health minister and that's where she's absolutely on side with this, bringing in as much private sector delivery and just defending it all as, well, you know, you'll never pay with your OHIP card. Never pay it's with your credit card. It'll always be your OHIP, never pay with yep. your credit card. Well, hopefully. But there's a lot of other things being sold well, to you. In again, to even procedure. if, even if it's all just straight ahead, one procedure, one elevated cost, we are paying with our proverbial credit card every time we pay our taxes to the Ontario government. Period. Absolutely. That money That's is it. going out the door, and we're not getting any more. We're actually we're getting less for the money that we spend. Period. And let's let's call it like it is. There are an awful lot of former progressive conservatives making money in the private healthcare system 
in the delivery of long-term care especially, which of course my care is privatized and, and, and opened up. So about two-thirds of that system is opened up. And again, an awful lot of conservatives, former premiers on the boards of these companies, these new companies that are coming in, these new clinics, very conservative linked. And of course, this conservative government wants to bring them in and allow them to operate. What, what is the, the a progressive conservative to me should have the progressive part means, you know, social programs are covered equally right across. And the conservative part means fiscally responsible. And putting profits into system where you don't need them is neither. Uh, let's talk about more about the Minden situation, because, um, you know, at a distance, it sounds like, how can you possibly do this? I know that there is a rationale for saying you actually can't have an emergency room uh, or department in a small municipality, a small facility like the Minden Hospital. That makes a lot of logical sense, logistical sense. But on the ground, all people hear is that we are losing our ER. What am I going to do if, you know, fill in the blank? There are answers. And there are other places where you, you know, you, I know you've covered lots of these stories where the, the ER w- was removed and then they had sort of this uh, um, a, a level below where there was, you know, a, a more severe care unit, but it wasn't really an emergency unit. And they're, they're, using, they're, they're kind of s- splitting hairs in terms of how they define it. Uh, but in this case, it sounds like there's nothing going in there. They've eliminated the entire uh, emergency room, uh, any kind of, uh, you know, sort of step down urgent care center, whatever it might be, is not going to be in there to replace it. And I thought I heard <laughs> originally them, you know, sort of the, the, the Tories there saying, um, no, nothing to worry about. We're, we're not going to touch your hospital. How do they defend this? Well, uh, Laurie Scott, the local conservative MPP and longtime veteran in that riding, uh, was basically, again, missing in action on this file until yesterday. <clears throat> Excuse me. Until yesterday. And she popped up with a plan. Okay, we, we, we are. I've been working behind the scenes for weeks to try and get an urgent care type, right, yep. you know, as you say, the next level down, which would not be 24-7, nope. by the way. Those nope. things are generally not like an emergency room would be. Uh, and, and the response from Minden residents has been pretty much, Really? Where have you been? Yeah. If there was talk of this going on, why are we just hearing about it now the day it's closing? Yeah. We just, they literally didn't believe her. And there's flat up saying, you will not be reelected in this riding. That's saying something. Uh, and that's right. saying something. It absolutely is saying something. Uh, people are, they're really angry about this. And the concern, of course, you know, as you say, they, okay, the emergency room, that means if I have a heart attack or a stroke or if dad does or whatever, I'm going to be extra an extra 15 minutes or an extra 20 minutes in an ambulance to get to Peterborough or wherever I need to get to. Is there a 24-hour ambulance service? Uh, yeah, because right. there's not in a lot of areas. Right. So it's one thing to close. It, and it's, of course, it, it's such an integrated system all the way around. You close an emergency room, a 24-7 emergency room in a community like Minden, which, by the way, I believe at this time of year, the population swells a little. What, what, what do you, how, as you say, how can the government defend this? They cannot defend this. They're trying to say it was a local decision, a local board decision. <laughs> uh, all hospitals are controlled by the Ontario government. It's 144 hospital corporations, I believe. They're run by the Ontario government, funded by the Ontario government. And if that operating room, or excuse me, if that emergency room, uh, if the government wanted to make sure it stayed open, it could have made sure it stayed open. Now, there might have been staffing issues. And we're hearing this in other small sure. regional yep. hospitals now, too. And we just, I saw one this morning. I, I'm sorry, I can't remember which it was. But they struck a deal with another nearby larger community hospital to, have, to share staff on weekends so that they can stay open on weekends during the summer mm-hmm. months. There's going to be more of that going on because, again, back to the, the, the resource, the staffing shortage. That's key to it all, of course. And that's why these emergency rooms, all of a sudden, they just they can't staff it. Well, then you have to share with hey, someone else. They can't staff the, the, the ERs in major centers in Toronto in some cases. Where, hey, so exactly. you know, they're closing them for you know five or six hours. And now, it's not as bad as it was, but I, this is not a, it, this is not a small bad. town problem. No, no, no. And in fact, I would think small towns have a slight advantage. Because they can say, look at the quality of life we can yep. give you if you come here yep. and keep our yep. emergency room open. You know, the, 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 the big city lifestyle is, is taking a big hit in Toronto these days. You know, there's a lot of uh, uh, the, the negative publicity is hitting home. And I would think that if I was a healthcare worker and I could make 
you know, the same kind of money for a much less stressful uh, job. In a, you know, an emergency room is going to be stressful wherever yeah. you go, but it's not going to be as busy as it is in downtown Toronto, is it? You know, if you're out in one of the smaller ones and that your quality of life, your, your family's quality of life could be so much higher. So I would hope that this gives these smaller communities some hope. But right now, uh, this Minden is the first uh, I, the canary in the coal mine. I suspect we'll see more of this happen. Uh, this is Pride Month, and the uh, government in Queens Park had to see this coming. The only thing that they could be glad about is that the session ends in ten days or whatever it might be. Then school's out in three weeks, and this will be kind of rearview mirror stuff. But um, York Region's Catholic School Board refusing to uh, fly the pride flag uh, has just blown up again, and it does so every year. Um, it, it for a lot of reasons the, the the debate has merit in terms of what the hell are you doing and what are you thinking, but above all, we get back Keith to this almost perennial debate about whether or not we need a Catholic school board. Why do we don't have just one school board? And I was talking on the radio this morning, <laughs> John Moore show. I said, do you know how many uh, school board trustees we have here in the city of Toronto? Nobody knew because nobody was paying attention. And I just, I just happened to look it up. It's not a criticism of the guys on the panel. There are 40, 4 zero, 40 <laughs> freaking trustees in Toronto between, and that's just the two school boards. I didn't include the French boards. Okay? No. So, <laughs> so we're probably pushing 50. Oh, right? easy. We've got 25 city councillors for the city of Toronto. And you will recall, well, <laughs> that the mm. premier said, you don't need twice as many. You don't need all those councillors. He cut the council in half. That was his first summer on the job. This summer, he could be doing the same thing. Let's just blow out that school board, eliminate the redundancies. Well, could... Look at that. Holy Why can't cow. we do that? It's the. It, I said it's third rail stuff for these guys. Oh, you, every time that you, you touch it, you know, John, ask John Tory about this. Who, who by the uh, way, was the it. last Tory to lose in the, in the riding that Laurie Scott. And Halliburton riding. Yes, yes, yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and Laurie Scott resigned so he could exactly. run in the safest yes. seat and he blew it. Yeah. Holy cow. That was a fun night. Uh, sorry. Uh, <laughs> you got me Excuse sidetracked me. there. Break for uh, this tangent. Uh, Go ahead. Uh, the, the original uh, point I wanted to make, uh, first of all, on the, uh, uh, the debate about school funding, Catholic school funding coming up again. The damn York Region Board is inviting this with this oh, position, entirely, are they not? Entirely. And and the Premier, come on. The Premier, and he pointed out, you know, he'll be marching in a, in a pride uh, parade again this year. Uh, that when they hit him with the York Region, he comes back with a no comment. Should have had a comment. Yeah. No comment is, you know, uh, not on this one, not this no. time. You've, you've gone far enough. You're marching in the parade. You're doing Make a comment on this one. You know, say something about the board. You don't have to threaten them. You just say, you know, just say you're disappointed. You don't have to say anything. Even just, I would have thought that in 2023, everyone could fly the fly the pride flag. Uh, but um, the issue itself, the the, the whole point of uh, the redundancies, the, the 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 funding funding a Catholic school board that won't abide by public school dictates. Why why continue to do mm -hmm. it? Why, you know, in so many communities where uh, the smaller ones, they, they, it took a lot of fighting, but the Catholic board finally got around to sharing school facilities with some public schools because they had yeah. to. They started sharing buildings. Well, let's get all the way down. Let's just share school boards uh, and just, you know, make it one public system. If the Catholics want to have a system where they don't fly, if Catholics' parents want to have a system, a school system where the pride flag is not flown and other dictates that they feel are, are, are core to their religion, they can set up after our schools, just like the Jewish uh, parents do. And you have to fund them yourselves, though. And that was John Toy's point. He was trying to get a tax break for those parents that were funding their own <laughs> schools. And it reverted to you know, the debate about funding Catholic schools and the whole thing just became a mess. But John Tory's original point was fair. The Jewish parents have done this themselves. They want to educate certain things that are not in the public education system, but they pay for that, and they don't even get a tax break for it. Here we have the Catholic system fully funded, and they still, you know, will, will say things like this. No, you're not going to fly the pride parade. So they invite this debate themselves. Uh, it would be good if the debate could actually be had, but the premier just hitting out with the no comment when he could have actually just, you know, anything, anything would have been better than a no comment on that, which was really, quite frankly, weak. And he's not normally a weak man when it comes to issues like this. Uh, he should have stood up and said more. Uh, and, you know, 
he'll take it on the chin a bit for that, but in the end, it won't hurt him. And of course, he will march in the Pride Parade, which is the right thing for him to do. Well, I, I, I dare say, yes, the Premier should show leadership on this. Uh, we heard uh, on um, the morning radio show this morning that um, there's a law professor at Western saying, you actually now, it's the, it will require a constitutional amendment to get rid of it, but it only focuses on Ontario. The Ontario legislature votes in favor of it, then it pushes it to the feds, and between the two legislatures, they can change this and, and eliminate the school board. Where in the past, you know, you would have needed all of the provinces to agree and 50% of the, all of the crap, the, the formula that went into it. So there is a mechanism there and a path to do this. Hey, Quebec and they've Newfoundland already done it, it. Right. If they've done it, Ontario can absolutely With a large do it. majority in the legislature, yes, you can. And so, yes, I think at that level, um, where's the premier on this? One. Two, and this is not necessarily your Ontario politics podcast content typically, but where's the archbishop on this? We had a new archbishop here in, in the Catholic archbishop here in Toronto. Where is he on this? I, you know, I like to think I'm paying attention. By now, I'm sh- pretty sure there would have been a quote. Something would have come up. You would think, uh, I'm sure someone has asked him. Maybe, Maybe not. not. I'd be disappointed if no reporter has asked him. I mean, that's a comment on journalism itself, but. Here's a man that is is not incredibly well known in the city yet. Nope. And, and commenting on something like this, showing leadership on an issue like this, would be something that would help him establish his name with the city of Toronto and the, with the people of Toronto. Yep. So uh, a very valid point. Where is the Archbishop? Why? Why the silence on this? And especially when uh, we see some parents getting so angry and so riled up about this and others keeping their kids home from school. Uh, out of concern about the, I think more the riled up folks than about anything that's going on with the pride flag or not. So it, it's uh, something that requires leadership, as you say, uh, not just from our politicians, mm-hmm. but perhaps from our church leaders. This is a, a, a Catholic school board. Where's the leadership? I mean, you will recall it was Cardinal Carter who shook hands with Bill Davis and said, "Thanks for the money," right? <laughs> oh, absolutely. <laughs> he got the funding for grades eleven and yeah. twelve. For those right not in the know, Catholics in those days and thirteen yeah, in those yeah. yes yeah I forgot you're right in those days funding for Catholic schools used to stop at grade ten, mm-hmm. uh, and then a lot of kids would switch over to the public system or you had to pay a, I think it was a few hundred dollars a year yeah to, it wasn't yeah. thousands or no millions. no no it was I, w- I was at St Mike's and so that's what happened and it, but it was about you know in those days uh, five six hundred bucks. Well, I remember saying to my parents, uh, I, I switched in grade nine to the public system because I didn't want to switch in grade 11. Right. I said, no, no, whereas my brothers stayed in the Catholic system, the younger brothers, I, I, I wanted out. I wanted to go to the public system. I don't know why, uh, but I went to the public system. And, and But again, because of that grade 10 or grade 11, I didn't want to have to switch yeah. uh, schools at, at grade 11. But uh, yes, you're right. Cardinal Carter was right there to thank Bill you Davis bet. for that. And, and Bill Davis, of course, once he secured uh, uh, Bob Ray and David Peterson's agreement to support the idea of fully funding Catholic schools, he then retired. Uh, <laughs> Good night, everybody. <laughs> yeah, I'm out the door. Good night. And because I remember more than anything that 1985 election, Frank Miller was then the PC leader. Yep. And it didn't matter which campaign bus I was on. There were people protesting because they had nowhere to yeah, go. Yeah, yeah. Bob Ray, the, the NDP leader at the time, and David Peterson, the, the liberal leader, had signed on to Bill Davis's plan. Like Cardinal, if Cardinal, helped, uh, Cardinal Carter helped secure that deal, Man, uh, Davis was genius because he again he walked out the door. He didn't didn't face the voters on that. Uh, the Conservatives won a slight minority, and and within a month, uh, they were defeated in the legislature, ending forty two consecutive years of PC rule in Ontario. Mm-hmm. So a, this is a, so again, I, I bring it back to that third rail reaction. It's an issue, no question. <laughs> it's, and, and, and it's easy to say on paper, this is how you would do it. You get this many votes and that many votes, and you move it on. Quebec's done it. Newfoundland, Labrador have done it. It's a little different <laughs> environment here in this province, and I'm not quite sure I can put my finger on the why, but the history of it says, watch out, watch out, absolutely. There's if you think back as well, Mike Harris. Um, he got fed up with the school boards as well, and he cut their salaries. Yeah, he took them that. all down to yeah, five thousand yeah. dollars. And well, it turned out some of them were making really handsome salaries, which was for, was supposedly a part time job. Yep. Well, it became careers. Oh, entirely or stepping stones. Yeah. <clears throat> Kathleen Wynn. to to <laughs> Josh right. Milo. Uh, <laughs> 
I mean, but you count the number of politicians who've <clears> served <throat> in the legislature or, uh, you know, provincially or federally or in council. Yeah, they, they hung around the trustee table. Um, actually, and, and without under the radar entirely, right? Nobody really paying any attention to how they were spending that billion dollar budget. Well, that's the thing. The size of these school board budgets right. are stunning. Yeah. They absolutely, they're huge. So again, if we could amalgamate the boards, I don't know that there would be massive savings, but there would certainly be physical plant savings and, and, and geographic things where we could coordinate things you better. You sell off a good third of the school properties. Yeah. Right? Yeah, exactly. Now that would be a, a sort of a one-time type sure. thing. But there would be long-term benefits as well. Well, well be sure. But you know what? The long-term benefit, and again, I go back to uh, St. Mike's. Um, at the corner of Bathurst and St. Clair, there used to be a gas station and a car wash there forever. And it was called the Crosstown, by the way. Um, <laughs> so, but, the, but the property was owned by the school. Gas station's gone. Car wash is gone. They are developing that corner. And what they're going to do is put a couple of towers in there, rental towers, the school still owns the property and will get the benefit of the rental income, right? Nice. So the Toronto Catholic District School Board has a shitload of property in this, right? If we could turn yeah. that, first of all, into housing is one, and two, to be able to say that the, the money that comes from that rental unit built for, you know, rental purposes goes into the school system, the education system locally, all of a sudden that solves a whole bunch of problems vis-a-vis the uh, development charges to some degree. Absolutely. Right? Yeah, yeah. Because now it's, it's going to go into the infrastructure in the local community. But nobody's thinking that way. And we would make probably make some dough. And would there be efficiencies? Yeah, I don't think you need two HR departments. You don't need two procurement departments. You don't need, you know... The maintenance departments, it, 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 like that kind of stuff back in, we can shrink down in a hurry. Oh, absolutely. There, there would be huge, huge savings in the, the, the duplications. Um, it would take time. It would take money as sure. well, you know, to, to cost things out. But the long-term benefits and the benefits of a single public education system, I think are, are obvious or should be obvious to all anyway. Um one thing I know we're, we're we're pushing our time. I just wanted to make sure we touched on was the um, the Stellantis, yeah. the, the the money yep. going to, to Stellantis. Where the deal was there, then it's not there. It was almost close. Well, the province is apparently willing to pony up one third of this deal, uh, which is something like thirteen billion in subsidies. Mm-hmm. That would take what Ontario's original share was going to be five hundred million dollars. Now they're saying it could be like four point three billion dollars. Just just Ontario's share. Uh, similar money went to uh, Volkswagen, although I think Ontario's share there was only the five hundred million, but the feds ponied up the rest of the thirteen billion. I know these are auto sector jobs, yep. and the, the future of the auto is these are electric vehicle uh, components and batteries. Uh, it's very important to be in that sector. I get that, and I, I get that they're you know talking seven jobs are spun off from every one mm-hmm. good auto paying uh, auto sector job. But at the same remarks Thursday, the premier noted, you know, that there's 380,000 jobs going wanting in Ontario. We don't have the people. We don't have, you know, in virtually every sector, he said. So why are we giving out billions and billions of dollars in subsidies to create jobs when we have a labor shortage? I I got nothing. (laughs) Yeah, I I don't either. And as I say, I get the long term (laughs) aspect of investing in electric vehicles uh, and in having keeping the manufacturing here. But we're literally talking about a huge job shortage here. I know Statistics Canada doubts it in many areas, but there seems to be obvious there's a shortage of labor. Uh, not a job shortage, a shortage of labor. And, and so why are we spending such massive amounts of money to bring jobs here when we don't have the workers we need now? Well, and it kind of goes back to the, you know, the, the question that we had around health care and capacity in the system. It's okay to say we're going to hire X number of thousands of nurses or X number of thousands of manufacturing jobs are going to be created. Who's going to do them, to your point? But not only that, how do we make sure that they're skilled up in this new world? I mean, talking about the you know manufacturing a car in 2030 is not going to resemble anything remotely close to, you know, at the turn of the century in the year 2000. 
you know, even. No. Like, it's just completely different technologies, process, uh, everything else that's gone into it. So where is the, the, the big brain thinking around how are we going to elevate, not just say we got people out there, but are they skilled up to do it? And where, how are we going to manage that? Uh, you don't hear us talking about that. Not specifically. I mean, the Labor Ministry of Monty McNaughton is a, a big advocate of skilled trades, but they need actual programs now in, in high Absolutely. schools and in community colleges to target specifically the areas you're talking about so that we'll be ready in four or five years because mm -hmm. it is changing so fast. Um, I'm concerned with the way that, you know, uh, uh, Stellantis basically, you know, they, they started construction on this factory and then stopped yep. because they saw Volkswagen got a better deal and we're going to go for leveraging, leveraging or blackmail or however you want to call it, you know, and, and, and this presents an interesting, uh, you know, the uh, premier Ford was, uh, it's their deal. It's the feds deal. We're just here to make sure that they get it through. He's definitely hanging this on the feds in case anything goes wrong. It's their deal. But again, the federal conservatives are against this corporate welfare type stuff. And here's Doug Ford again. Christian Freeland, my good buddy, my best friend. Yep. We're on the phone till two in the morning making sure we get this Talantis deal done. So the, 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 the politics of it all is, is fascinating. I get, as I say, why the governments are trying to position uh, Canada and Ontario into this new sector, this quickly evolving sector. But we should be doing more, as you said. It's, it's the education system, the the, the Community colleges especially, and, and uh, senior level, the grades 11 and 12, get these kids, get them started on, on you know, not just coding. We're so far past coding mm -hmm. now. Uh, the AI is going to do the coding. Yep. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and so, but we're going to get to a point where this is not, we're not manufacturing vehicles. We're manufacturing technology, right? I mean, that's what we learned from Elon Musk. Tesla is not an auto m manufacturer. It's a tech company that happens to be all, you know, up in the grill of, yeah. of what looks like a car. But that's, that's where we're at. And we, we don't think of it in terms of that level of innovation thinking. So, um, but before we go, um, I know you guys are front and center as far as uh, everybody's worrying about, certainly in the east of Toronto, uh, about the wildfires. I know there's, um, the, the, the story's been ongoing in, in British Columbia and Alberta. Um, I talked to Aaron off and on over the past week, and needless to say, uh, she and Dan and the girls know people who've lost their homes. Um, it's not at the scale that we see in some other areas of the country in terms of the, 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 the damage done. But I think what I, I'm getting from the story, Keith, is that this is, it's not unusual to have a wildfire or a bushfire in Nova Scotia. But the location of it and the timing of the fires are so early. This is what's getting a little scary. It's way, way, way earlier than Nova Scotia starts getting wildfires. And of course, uh, they're fueled by Hurricane Fiona went through last fall and just took out millions of trees, trees that were in full canopy. Yep. So all that's been just laying on the ground. Talk about fuel for fires. And you mentioned the location. I mean, this is so close to Halifax. It's scary. I mean, they're basically neighborhoods of bed. They're, they're talking areas that we would consider to be Halifax. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, 151 homes gone. Uh, one family, I, and there may be others, but one family lost their home and their cottage. Um, one of the TV, local CTV anchor was on the air when he got the notice that he's, his house was being evacuated. Mm -hmm. um, so many people. There was so many stories, so many compelling stories going on this week. Um, um, the fires were jumping and changing so rapidly they had to change the evacuation routes. Trailers loaded with horses. They had to set the horses free. They couldn't get them yeah. out. Yeah. Holy, you, you just think of all these things going on. There was some rain, heavy rain in the forecast today, tonight, and, and hopefully for the next couple of days. The temperature is cooling off. So that's what's really, really needed. Uh, I'm a couple hours away. I'm about 200 kilometers from the, the Halifax area fires. And uh, today is the first day we've got smoke in our forecast. I wasn't smelling it yet this morning, but it's actually in our weather forecast for today. Yeah. So this is so early, so scary, because as I say there's so many everywhere, everywhere in the province, every highway you drive down, some back roads, main highways, there's just trees over everywhere still all over the place. So when the province said, uh, as I mentioned earlier, it seemed like a pandemic measure almost, no going into the woods, nobody, no off-roading, no four by four, no camping, no anything, no going into the woods. Uh, and it was the mayor of Halifax who said, you know, we need a no stupid rule and people are violating it. <laughs> so then there was one guy out burning leaves with a, a flamethrower. Like, 
after this kind of nonsense. So, you know, that's the Nova Scotia way is stop breaking the stupid rule. Yeah. And uh, hopefully yeah. that and the rain combined will uh, help them get the hand on this this weekend. Yeah, well, and for those of you, you know, well, it's just this nature taking care of nature. We got the rain coming in to take care of the of the fires. Um, yeah, but uh, if, if, if... Oh, it's mostly volunteer firefighters. Yep. Almost all of them are volunteer. And it took till uh, Wednesday, I think, to, to, for the government to say, okay, we'll pay your mileage. They, like, they're coming from all over. We'll pay your mileage. No, nothing else. They wouldn't, you know... Uh, great thing about Nova Scotia is um, there's more food being prepared and brought to them than they can eat. Oh, well. Than the yeah. emergency responders, which is not no, unusual. No, no, that's, and that's, that's kind of the, the, the beauty of it. But uh, one of the things I heard one of the deputy fire chiefs uh, in one of the briefings, I guess a couple of days ago, you know, how are your resources? Basically the question. We're stretched, but, and we've got firefighters who want to come and help, but we're telling them, you have to stay where you are because we have 11 stations or 13 stations, whatever, in Halifax proper that need to be staffed in case all hell breaks loose in the city is a something, you know, a regular, regular day emergency. You guys need to be there too. So. Oh, and to just last night, the major, uh, the largest historic tennis club in Halifax in the city caught fire. There you go. Huge, huge fire. Yeah. So yeah, they're absolutely need to stay in the city. Yeah. It's, and it's, these fires are so close to the city. That it is very, very frightening. So that 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 rain is desperately needed and and, and really welcomed. Yeah, I was talking to Erin, and she said, uh, you know, to describe this to folks in in Ontario, this would be like wildfires in Don Mills, like tree leafy yeah, yeah. neighborhoods. There's you know the the valley has the forest element to it, but that's the kind of suburban areas that are on fire. Yeah, uh, okay, absolutely. Wow. <laughs> It's, it's, it's the, 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 the area I'm in is the same thing. There's just trees, a good stand of trees, not, you know, 50 meters from the houses. Yep. It's, just, it's just where a lot of them are. Some of them, of course, are right into the trees. And that's those are the ones we've lost, I think. Well, my friend, uh, have a good weekend, and uh, rain or not. And we'll, uh, we'll chat with you uh, next weekend as they, um, they retire the session at, uh, at Queen's Park. Good to talk to you, Keith. Thank you, Dave. All right, that's On The Ledge, your Ontario politics podcast, and we all do it for Story Studio Network. This is SSN. Story Studio Network.